I was nine when this happened. My sister, my dad, my stepmom and I were at a place called Palmetto Island. It was a camping resort where you just pull up with a tent or camper and just stay there for a weekend or so. We were in a camper. Before I get into the actual story, I should set the scene. Palmetto Island wasn't really an island in the traditional sense. It was completely surrounded by palm trees and vegetation except for the road in and out. There were roads in the resort, but they were only for golf carts and other smaller vehicles. The whole place was also dense with palm trees and vegetation. If you weren't on the road, in a campsite, or at one of the recreational areas, you would be in a forest. Now for the actual story. We were all hanging at only one of the playgrounds. I had made a new friend who I was playing with. At some point, the rest of my family had left me to play with my new friend until eventually he left too. I was there alone, and the sun was beginning to set. This wasn't the first time we'd been to Palmetto Island and I had, at the time, known pretty well. I had assumed that the walk back to our campground would be short. However, at some point I got turned around and ended up at the area where you would launch boats into the water to go fishing. There was a group of people there, and I asked them for directions. Now I wasn't completely brain dead, so I lied and said the number of our campsite was about 10 sites down from our actual campsite. They pointed me in the right direction, and I started walking. Now, I hadn't known this at the time, but my family had realized I was no longer at the playground and started driving around in our golf cart and another one they had rented. If they hadn't, I probably wouldn't be telling this story. As I'm walking toward our campsite, a car pulls up beside me and one of the people I had asked for directions rolls down the window. Keep in mind, I had been walking for about an hour or two in total. He offers me a ride and tells me to ride in the front seat. Me, tired and weary from walking, accepts and gets in the car. I know, now, that that is something you should never do. We're driving in the right direction until he passes up the entrance to the campsites, at which point I know something is wrong. I tell him he passed it up and he doesn't respond. By some stroke of divine luck, I see my dad in a golf cart driving the opposite direction as us, and I start yelling and waving at him. He pulls up in front of the car and stops, and so does the guy driving. I use the manual unlock in the car door and run to my dad, who has his conceal carry drawn on the guy as soon as I'm out of the way. He calls the police and holds the guy at gunpoint until they get there and they arrest him. I'm only now telling this story because I found out last week that the guy and his whole family had done this before, and they had gotten away with it. I try not to think about what would have happened to me had my dad not showed up when he did. Creepy family that tried to kidnap me. Let's not meet. I am a woman, and was 19 at the time of these events. You will see how this is relevant later. I love camping. Anytime my friends and I came home from college, we would load up our cooler with beer, grab some gear, and go screw around outside. Unfortunately, when I was actually at school, none of my sorority sisters or other friends ever wanted to go with me, so I would often suffer withdrawals from camping. One day, the weather was way too nice to waste, so I grabbed some of my gear, hopped in a car I borrowed from a buddy, and drove to a spot that was secluded, yet within a safe distance to civilization that I could run and get help. Camping also creeps me out sometimes, but that creepy feeling is also somewhat of a plus for me. It's the same reason that people read these stories. It's fun to be scared. So I make a little camp and get a fire going. I hadn't brought all that much to eat, but I was enjoying myself reading and looking around the area, that sort of thing. I got the feeling I was being watched and I stopped dead in my tracks. I hear a twig crunch over to my right, then see a dew bolt from a hundred feet or so in front of me. I laughed at myself and went back to the camp with the armful of wood I had gathered. I kept freaking myself out, hearing sounds just outside of the ring of light cast by the fire. I always get inside my head, so I shrugged it off and kept whittling at a stick I had been messing with. Around one, I decide to go into my tent and snuff out the lantern. I had been slamming beers in the most unladylike fashion and smoking cheap cigars. Another reason I like camping, I can act however I want, so I passed out relatively quickly. Around two, I start hearing footsteps. They sound pretty light and sort of timid. 
I think to myself that it's a deer or other animal, more likely a raccoon, because I had probably left some food out. I'm still on guard, though. About 30 minutes of sleeping with one eye open, I hear a rubbing noise, and the tent fabric is being pushed in a bit. I don't know how I didn't shit my sleeping bag, but I just sat there paralyzed with my combat knife in my hand. I desperately wanted to thrust the knife through the tent fabric, but I was still holding out hope that it was some of my buddies from a frat joking with me. And then, as suddenly as it had begun, it all stopped. I was starting to feel slightly more secure, because daylight would be coming in about two or three hours. But I sure as shit wasn't going to go to sleep. All of a sudden, at about four in the afternoon, I realized I should put my boots on so that, if anything did happen, I would be ready. After having stayed up and keeping alert a little while longer, my friend's car alarm goes blaring. I freak the fuck out and run out of the tent. I got about two steps before something grabs me around the mouth. I open my mouth to scream, but instead the person's pinky finger slips between my teeth. I've heard that people can perform superhuman feats when they have huge adrenaline rushes. In my case, I just clamped down and there's no way to say this without sounding ridiculous, his finger popped off. He screamed, pulled his hand away with the missing digit falling to the ground. He took off running down the hill I was camping on. I took off right quickly in the opposite direction. I must have looked ridiculous to the people whose house I ran to, a little sorority girl in a wife beater, boxers, and steel toe boots. I also had some blood that had oozed out of my lip, not from the finger, but because I had also managed to take a pretty good chunk out of my lip as well. I told them what happened, they called the police, got me some real clothing, and the man at the house made me a whiskey and coke. When the cops got there, they checked it out. The cops went to check it out, and when they came back, it was light out. They brought me back so I could get my friend's car, and what I saw just made me more scared. Right next to the tent was a red gas can. He could have just lit me on fire earlier. The finger was also gone, suggesting he had come back. The kicker is they never caught the guy, so somewhere out there is a man sitting down to dinner, maybe alone, maybe with a wife and a couple of kids, and he's missing his right pinky. I work summers as a camp counselor in the northern parts of Ontario, Canada. On the date this particular incident occurred, I was camping with a group of 10-year-old boys on the same lake the summer camp was based on. So, like a routine camping trip, we canoe out to the site and set up our tents. Me and the other counselor, Mike, take turns supervising the kids while they swim, build forts and play games, etc. We cook some food over the fire, sit around and tell stories, cook s'mores, the typical Canadian camping experience. Around nine at night, I tell the kids it's time for bed, and they head into their tents, which were positioned a small walk away from the shoreline but still in line of sight from where we had the fire pit. So the kids have gone to bed and me and Mike are shooting the shit by the water, smoking a cigarette, just basically hanging out before we decide to head into our tent and call it a night. What happened next still troubles me to this day and remains my go-to-scary campfire story. We were both gazing into the pitch-black night water when we saw a small light approaching us slowly and slightly above water level. We speculated what it could possibly be for a few minutes before it came close enough for us to see that it was mounted on the front of a kayak and that someone was approaching our campsite. Now, it is important to note that as a camp counselor, part of our training goes over how to deal with stranger encounters in an environment where we are responsible for a group of children on public property. I was prepared to give the mystery paddler the typical speech about how we are camping with a group from a recognized organization, and we would respectfully ask that they find another campsite. However, this person's appearance shook me to the bone as the light drew nearer. Paddling this kayak was a woman who looked to be in her 60s. She had incredibly long wisps of gray hair that were trailing in the water. Her skin looked like old leather, and her dead-looking eyes were tough to spot under all her wrinkles. She looked directly at me, and when she spoke I realized she was missing most of her teeth. Are all your children safe in bed? She asked me to point in the direction of the tents. Not really knowing how to respond and quite frankly shitting myself, I responded by telling her that they were fine and she had to leave. That's good. 
just as expected for this time, she said with a smile, then turned her kayak and paddled off into the night. At this point in time, myself and Mike were legitimately very creeped out not only by the appearance of this mystery woman who resembled a freaking corpse, but also her inquiry on the whereabouts and safety of the kids we had brought on this trip. Not knowing what else to do, we grabbed our hunting knives and sat by the fire after checking on the kids. Half an hour later is where shit started to get really creepy. Across the lake, a female counselor was leading another trip for kids the same age group. She sent me a text which read something along the lines of, Hey, scene. Stop screwing with us. This isn't funny. My kids are really creeped out. I instantly called her and let her know I had just seen someone near my campsite that seemed eerie and that I was not trying to play a joke. Apparently, one of their kids had opened their tent door to take a piss and saw a woman with long hair standing with her arms open towards them near the shoreline. Back in 2011, I was within a circle of friends that made it a tradition to go camping at a certain spot every May long weekend. The spot we chose was in a beautiful area right on the edge of a large lake and was located on government land. The lake itself had a dam on it, so during May long, the water levels were always low, if not completely empty, making it possible to walk across it. People were allowed to camp there as long as they weren't causing trouble or making a mess, and it was generally a good time for everyone. The spots themselves were spaced far enough apart that you had your own privacy, but not far enough that you couldn't meet other people. In this particular year, our spot was in the middle of a small hill, with one campsite below us and one above us. The first night of our trip happened without incident. During the second day, the people staying at the site below us had moved in. We didn't think much of it, and continued drinking throughout the day and into the night. At about around midnight, the people at the campsite below us were really out of control. They were yelling and screaming and their music had gotten even louder, so our friend Ben went down to ask them to turn it down. He was promptly punched in the face, and he came back to inform us that he was 90% sure they were on drugs. After that, the vibe wasn't as relaxed and we were all somewhat on edge. I was feeling really tired, so I just decided to go to bed. Some of my friends were still awake, including Ben, and one couple, Lily and Derek, that were visiting another campsite we had made friends with that day. I could hear that the campsite below was still blasting their music and partying pretty hard, but I just tried to ignore it and go to sleep. I don't know what time it was when I was jolted awake. Parts of this are somewhat of a blur. All I know is that I sat straight up as soon as I heard the screaming and yelling coming from outside my tent. I quickly ran outside to find our campsite in chaos. One of my friends was clutching their chest. People were running around and screaming to call an ambulance. I was quickly informed of what happened. Apparently, not long after I had gone to bed, the people camping at the site below us decided they weren't finished talking to Ben, and on their way up, they encountered Lily and Derek walking back. Now Derek and Ben are about the same height and have the same color hair, so they assumed that Derek was Ben and bottled both him and Lily over the head with a full glass bottle. I don't know if it was the same guys that showed up at our campsite, but I was told that everyone else was sitting around the fire when two or three huge guys appeared from the darkness and walked over to them. One had a paring knife and the other had a butcher's knife in their hands. Ben saw the knives and had gotten up to talk to them and had barely spoken a word when the guy with the paring knife stabbed him once in the chest. At the same time, some people from the campsite above had seen the guys coming and came down to help. One of the guys, Tim, was coming down the hill when the guy with the butcher's knife ran up to him and stabbed him in the stomach. From there, sheer panic ensued. People called the police, but the ambulance was over a half an hour away. This is where I came out of the tent. Tim's wound was bleeding profusely, and he was losing blood way too quickly. His friends ended up putting him in the back of his car and speeding off to meet the ambulance halfway. Ben was also bleeding, but his wound wasn't as deep as Tim's, and we were able to keep him calm until an ambulance arrived. The guys with the knives ran off into the darkness, back down to their campsite, and took off in their Land Rover. My boyfriend at the time and I had gotten into his car and drove to the entrance to try and flag down the policemen on their way to the scene. Once they arrived, 
we were informed to stay in the car, as they had released a canine search unit to hunt down the people who stabbed our friends. By the end of the night, they had arrested the men. They had tried to flee by driving their vehicle across the lake bed, where they got stuck in a muddy section of the lake. They were on a concoction of several drugs, as suspected. Luckily, both Tim and Ben survived, although Tim had lost a lot of blood and took a few weeks to recover from his wounds. It was definitely the scariest thing I have ever experienced, and a few of us had to testify against them in court. This may be a ramble of thoughts, but after recently stumbling on this sub, I finally felt a place I could offer something that my family and I experienced a few years ago that to this day gives me a shiver. I have been camping, solo backpacking, and hunting my whole life in Oregon, and felt comfortable in the woods, and have a deep respect for nature. A few years ago, my wife, daughter, and two German shepherds went camping north of Mount Jefferson, Oregon. I have included the coordinates of our campsite, which we found to be the perfect setup for us, and our two dogs who need privacy since they are intimidating to other dog owners and can be loud when spooked. It was not an established campsite, just a nice horseshoe off a United States Forest Service road that had flat ground full trees and a fire pit. The first night, my daughter wanted to sleep by herself in a two-man tent right next to ours. It was maybe two feet away from me and my wife's tent. We made the male German Shepherd sleep. Guts is his name with her in the tent. That whole first night, neither my wife and I could sleep. We both heard footsteps, and they were heavy, not like typical forest critters scampering around the night. I was well armed because I was paranoid from reading recently before departing about a dad in California who was shot and killed in a tent next to his two infant daughters. Needless to say, both my wife and I had two pistols and my rifle with me. The dogs are great at detection, and that is why I felt my daughter could sleep alone, because Guts is completely fearless, and nothing would lay a hand on her without a battle to the death. All in all, nothing but bad vibes and loud footsteps occurred that night, which I ultimately decided was deer or maybe some elk. Day two. Morning we go for a walk down the road and maybe 300 feet away. See the circle area in the photo. I saw an abandoned road with a rusted gatepost, but the gate was missing, and it was covered in vegetation. Something of blue color caught my eye and guts immediately took off running down this abandoned road. My heart began to race because I thought it was another family camping like us, and he was going to get himself shot or scare some innocent people to death, so I chased after him as fast as I could. And the rest followed. He stops after 20 eft into the road and me yelling his name, but I have covered just enough distance to see that there is nobody there and something is off about the sight. I yell, hello, is anyone there? Sorry about the dog. I got no response. My curiosity gets the best of me and I have to see what the sight conditions are. As I got closer, I knew something was wrong. It had all the necessities for a campsite, including a cooler, propane burner, tent, blankets, folding table, but every single item had been completely destroyed, smashed, and torn from what appeared to be claw marks. We all walked around in circles, puzzled why anyone would leave all their camping gear behind, including an expensive designer tent. I figured, well, someone left in a hurry and animals got to the rest as the only logical explanation. Still, a propane tank and cooler were flattened by something, and it certainly wasn't snow-packed with tree coverage in that spot. As the afternoon rolls in, me and my daughter are playing baccaball ball at the campsite, and my wife is walking maybe 70 feet north to do her business. I do not have direct line of sight on her, but all of a sudden I see Guts make a mad dash straight towards her. Normally, he would always be with me unless he was called over and she didn't call for him. His speed and focus caught my attention, and I knew something weird was happening. So I ran over there and my wife started jogging at me, and I immediately drew my pistol. Guts had completely continued running into the forest another 100 feet before I called him, and he stopped. My other dog, Lee, who never misses the opportunity to be the pack leader, is not taking points. I have had her for seven years now, and this was the first time in her life she refused to leave my daughter's side. She was fully raised and attached to us at the hip. Again, any time we hike or play, 
Leah is up front bossing everything in her path and pauses to look to see where we are and continues. I asked my wife what happened and she said I was trying to pee and all of a sudden I felt all my hairs raise. I know someone was watching me and then I saw guts running towards me and I just got up to move towards you. We spent 10 minutes looking for signs of anything and saw no trails, broken branches, nothing to point to what and where something went. We decide we are spending one more night since it's too late to pack up and drive, but we will all be in the big tent together. Before we go to bed, I put a rope with a makeshift coin alarm around the perimeter of our campsite. I used a mint can and some coins and keys from our truck and zip-tied it so anything hitting the rope gave a little jingle. Very unsophisticated, but it put my wife at ease. As I go to tie my last corner off at a tree near our tent, our third mystery item unveils itself. It looks like someone has done the same exact thing I have done with a rope that was so old and brown I didn't see it at first. It was broken, and only a few pieces remain, but sure enough, it was tied at roughly the same height, 810, in off the ground, and even had a few rusted washers on it. I immediately felt someone has stayed here before, and put the same makeshift warning system on the same tree I am maybe 10-15 years ago, based on the condition of the rope. Perhaps my paranoia has now reached a new height, but I had to make sure the girls felt we are safe, and at the time, the only thing I could think of was when the evening came around. I made them sit in the truck, and I fired a clip of my forty-five into the dirt as a signal to whatever was out there, that we are armed. I reassured the girls that anybody listening to that now knows we have two wolves, and are armed, and we are too risky of a target, so we can sleep safely. That night we heard no footsteps and the dogs never perked up and barked. We left early the next morning. Fast forward to today and I watched the Amazon Missing 4-1 Hunted documentary and I noticed the cluster smack dab close to where we camped that weekend and a flood of dread rushes me as I think of that mysterious abandoned campsite with the ripped tent and smashed cooler and cooktop. We have been camping since and have enjoyed the beauty of the Northwest, but there was something there at that place that possibly took or harmed someone else less than 300 feet away from where we camped, and we all thank our lucky stars Guts was doing his thing so well that afternoon.